feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity webinar. It's as always a great pleasure that you are joining us. Uh, Professor David Dodik is with us tonight and he is the expert to talk about brain health. Um, his presentations, I'm for sure, will trigger lots of questions. So please use the Q&A function to send your question um, and we will answer them. As always, while having this webinar, we are starting with a short presentation. And tonight, Casey G, a PhD student at the NUS Healthy Longevity Translational Research Program, is giving that. And she will talk about the effect of medium chain triglycerides for Alzheimer's disease related cognitive impairment. It's a systematic review and meta analysis. Casey. Thank you for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Casey, and I'm a graduate student at the Center for Healthy Longevity. Today, I would like to share with you a systematic review and meta-analysis that our lab has recently published, which looked at the effect of median chain triglyceride for Alzheimer's disease-related cognitive impairment. Alzheimer's disease, or AD, is the most common form of dementia. It accounts for 60 to 80% of all dementia cases. One of the early symptoms of AD is the loss of short-term memory, followed by graduate decline in other cognitive domains, leading to the eventual loss of functional abilities in patients. So the risk of AD increases by two times every five years after the age of 65. Given the increase in life expectancy, it is estimated that by 2050, there will be at least 115.4 million people with AD. The current lack of effective drug therapies for AD has prompted the researchers to seek alternative nutritional therapies such as median chain triglyceride or MCT. It has been shown that compared to healthy brain, an AD brain has reduced efficacy of glucose uptake and glycolysis. In the absence of glucose, ketone bodies are the alternative energy source for the brain. Ketone bodies are able to cross the blood-brain barrier to produce a source of energy for the blood-brain cells. MCTs are a source of ketone bodies which can be obtained from diet or exogenous supplementation. Multiple studies have suggested that increased ketone levels obtained through the consumption of MCT supplementation or coconut oil may provide an alternative energy source in AD and alleviate the severity of symptoms in patients. However, results have been controversial and inconclusive. Therefore, the systematic review aimed to provide an up-to-date summary of the effect of MCT on AD and related cognitive impairment. Through meta-analysis, we found a significant trend favoring the use of MCT for improvements in general cognitive function in cognitive impaired patients. As can be seen here that the level of significance for the total effect was 0.03. Moreover, when we studied the effect of apoe e epsilon 4 genotype, which is a major genetic risk factor associated with AD, we found that people without the epsilon 4 allele responded better to MCT treatment. This suggests that people with epsilon 4 allele may have a different dose response pattern compared to those without, and hence differences in pathophysiology. Despite the potential effect benefits of MCTs in patients with AD or those at higher risk of AD, 
The use of MCT has been controversial due to the concern of increased cardiovascular disease risk. MCTs are a type of saturated fat, and intakes of saturated fat have been shown to increase total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol levels. Thus, the potential harmful health effects on chronic consumption of MCT has been a concern for its use. However, in our review, we found that MCT consumption led to improvements in cognitive function without adversely impacting on cardiometabolic risk factors. So what's the take home message? First, there is still a lack of studies to consistently show the effect of MCT. Our review only identified 10 eligible studies and only four of them had available data for meta-analysis. Moreover, patient characteristics, methods used for quantitative assessment and the MCT dosage used were very different between studies. Therefore, future interventions should provide better characterized patient populations and more consistent study designs in order to arrive at a conclusion supported by stronger evidence. Finally, not all studies control for the APOE e genotype, as we have seen that people may respond differently depending on their genetics. Therefore, the relationship between genetics and MCT should be considered in future studies to increase the precision of effect estimates. Nevertheless, the available studies have provided some evidence that treatment with MCT could improve general cognitive function in cognitive impaired patients and hence reduce the prevalence of AD in the face of an aging population. More details of this review could be found in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Casey. Uh, and congratulations to that very nice publications. And I think, let's see how much dietary interventions we can do and improve to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease in the end. But now over to um, our main speaker, and it's a great honor to introduce Professor David Dodek. And he is the Professor Emeritus, Distinguished Investigator and Distinguished Educator at the Mayo Clinic. And he is consultant at the Mayo Clinic Global. He's the co-chair of the Atria Acad Academy of Science and Medicine. He is the Chief Science Officer at Atria Health. She, he is also the chair of the American Brain Foundation, and the co-chair of the World Federation of Neurology World Brain Day. He founded at the Mayo Clinic and directed the headache and the concussion programs, and he also co-founded the International Concussion Society. Um, that's not enough. He also has lots of affiliations with universities where he is teaching and he's doing research, under which the University of Copenhagen at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and at the Thomas Jefferson uh, University. He is very productive. He has authored more than 900 peer-reviewed manuscripts, and he authored or even edited 13 books. So it's an honor to have you here, um, Professor Dolek, David, um, to really share your thoughts about how our brain can age much more healthier. Thank you so much to be here. Well, Professor Meyer, Andrea, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for, for this invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me to speak on the topic of what I call brain spam. Uh, we, you hear many of the people here today are interested in healthy lifespan and health span, uh, but um, that's not enough and we need to actually be able to look after our brains because at the end of the day, that's what allows me to present today and that's what allows you to understand what it is that I'm saying. So I ask, I, I wonder how many of you have actually had a brain health evaluation during your last physical examination? I reckon none of you, uh, because it's simply not done today uh, in routine medical care. And yet we have the know-how and the technology to be able to measure and monitor brain health and to be able to predict the risk of cognitive decline in dementia and to be able to intervene and modify some of those risk factors uh, that, may, that may actually have an impact on cognitive aging and dementia. So as clinician scientists and brilliant people like Drs. Meyer and Kennedy push the boundaries of longevity, as, as Dr. Hood said in his book on the age of scientific wellness, if we don't keep our brains healthy, longevity will be more of a curse than a boon. And anyone who intends to live a long and healthy life should be laser focused 
on their cognitive health because it matters now more than ever as the population ages. So this is just an overview of what I wanted to cover over the next 25 minutes or so. The first is to just review with you the urgency and how and why brain health has become a major global, global public health priority. I believe that over the next 50 years, we'll be talking about brain health in the same way we've talked about heart health over the last 50 years. The timing is right because there are growing global public awareness campaigns that will create an awareness and an understanding of why this is important and how we can as a population and as a medical community intervene to change the brain health trajectory of people all over the world. We'll talk a little bit about the opportunity that we have right now in terms of the pre-symptomatic detection of disease before symptoms actually begin and therefore the importance of prevention uh, as well as treatment. And then finally, we'll talk about the implications for the general public and for us as clinicians, as we try to integrate best practices for the care of our patients. So from the standpoint of a, this being, there being a sense of urgency, brain diseases affect one in three people across the globe. So precious few of us actually have escaped the clutches of brain diseases, either personally um, or in, with regard to our loved ones and friends and family. They're the number one cause of disability in the world, the number two cause of death behind cardiovascular disease, and they're actually the fastest growing cause of death among all non-communicable diseases across the world. When I began my training a few years ago, actually about 32 years ago to be, to be exact, I was told at that time that there are 800,000 ischemic strokes in the United States every year, and that 80% of them are preventable. Unfortunately, 32 years later, there are still 800,000 strokes in the United States every year. And I reckon that more than 80% of them are preventable because of the advances in therapeutic uh, technologies. In addition, 40% of dementia is felt to be preventable. And we'll get into that in just a moment, but a very famous now landmark paper known as the Lancet Commission on Dementia back in 2020 identified at least 12 independent risk factors for dementia and said that 40% of them are modifiable. So we'll talk about this as we go along in this presentation. In terms of the societal cost and personal cost to neurological and brain diseases, stroke, dementia, and sleep alone cost $3 trillion annually. That's just three neurological disorders. So one can see that as the population ages, if we don't do anything to prevent these diseases, it will become societally unsustainable. The risk of death, unfortunately, is up by more than 50% over the past two decades. And the disability from these diseases is expected to rise by more than 50% over the next two decades. And unfortunately, about 80% of the burden of brain diseases actually fall in low and middle income communities. And that's devastating because, for example, in Africa, um, there isn't a single country that has a national plan to actually prevent any of these neurological diseases. So there's work to be done. So because of that, a number of organizations are now launching global public awareness campaigns. And an important event happened last year when the World Health Organization held during the World Health Assembly in Geneva in May of 22, a forum where they uni unanimously adopted and improved their intersectoral global action plan for neurological disorders. This is the first time this was ever done because of the sense of urgency and because of the opportunity that we have to actually detect and prevent some of these diseases before they actually occur. So neurological disorders have definitely, this has launched uh, the opportunity to optimize brain health across the life course. And this is a seminal publication, I think from the World Health Organization uh, that hasn't been adequately disseminated yet, uh, but will be picked up, I'm sure, in, in, in an increasing way in the future. But what they set was a benchmark such that in 10 years, 80% of countries will have programs for brain health promotion and the prevention of neurological diseases. 
That means that the way I practice neurology for the past 30 years will diminish over time. And that is that we practice very reactive and sick care where patients present with symptoms of a disease. You do diagnostics, you make a diagnosis, and then you try to treat or palliate that disease. Unfortunately, many neurological diseases are inexorably progressive. And so oftentimes you've missed the window of opportunity. So I think in the future, we're going to see brain health clinics, and we already are uh, popping up around the, this country and around the world in an effort to try to preempt and prevent some of these devastating diseases. A number of global, health global brain health initiatives have started, the CDC, uh, the AARP, the NIH, and a number of others have started brain health initiatives. And many ne leading neurological societies have doubled down on this over the past year. So the European Academy of Neurology and the American Academy of Neurology have launched global public uh, health brain health initiative. Uh, the World Federation of Neurology, as Andrea mentioned, has launched a brain health initiative, and I'm fortunate to be co-chairing a World Brain Day for the World Federation of Neurology. Now, it's interesting that over the past half dozen years, we focused World Brain Day to try to raise awareness and an understanding of individual brain diseases from epilepsy to multiple sclerosis and dementia. But now, starting last year, we dedicated World Brain Day to brain health for all, and we'll continue that theme for the foreseeable future. And a number of us representing different brain foundations and organizations from around the world have gotten together and last month published sort of global synergistic actions that we believe are necessary to improve, improve brain health for human development. So there's a, there's a wave coming. We're going to be hearing much, much more about this because of the opportunity and because of the crisis um, and the existential crisis that these diseases place for, for all of society. So from an opportunity standpoint, I mentioned the Lancet Commission, uh, which identified 12 risk factors, 40% of which uh, they determined to be modifiable. And interestingly, with each additional risk factor, there is a lower cognitive performance that's equivalent to three years of cognitive aging. And as people age, that association um, is actually increased so that people with no risk factors in their 40s to 70s show similar cognitive performance to people 10 or 20 years younger with many risk factors. So the 60 really is uh, the new 40, if you will. If we do what we can do to modify those risk factors that are modifiable. Unfortunately, as a medical community and as a society, we're not doing a very good job at just the simple things. I've heard that and believe that some of these most potent risk factors for cardiovascular disease and dementia are not only modifiable, but we can make these orphan diseases. But unfortunately, here in the United States, just to give an example, there are 37 million people with diabetes, 98 million with prediabetes. So that's a staggering number, actually, when you consider that Alzheimer's disease has been referred to as type 3 diabetes because insulin insensitivity and inadequate glucose disposal is known to be a potent risk factor for dementia. In the United States, two thirds of people are overweight and 42% of the population is obese and that's expected to rise to 50% over the next several years. And yet, despite the plethora now of new anti-obesity treatments, less than 2% who actually meet criteria for one of these treatments are actually on them. Nearly 50% of adults across the globe and here in the United States have hypertension. In the United States, it's about 122 million people. However, here only 24% are actually controlled. And across the globe, it's even worse. Only about 14 to 15% of people with hypertension are controlled. And we know hypertension to be the single most important and potent risk factor for ischemic stroke, for cardiovascular disease, and now increasingly for dementia. On top of all of that, Exercise, as we know, is probably the most potent therapy for healthy longevity, as well as for brain health, not surprisingly. And yet here in this country, only about one in four in the United States are actually exercising enough, getting the CDC recommended 150 minutes of exercise per week. So we could be doing a lot better as a society in modifying some of these risk factors um, that are potent independent risk factors uh, for 
deteriorating brain health and for unhealthy cognitive aging. You know, it's been said that we accept cognitive aging to be an inevitable consequence of aging. In fact, we, we often joke about it and there are memes of course, like senior moments and we even call it benign senescent forgetfulness. There's nothing benign about it and there should be nothing inevitable about it. So I think accepting that is inevitable, accepting, accepting cognitive decline as an inevitable consequence of aging will be one of the most tragic failures of modern medicine that we'll look back on. So there is an opportunity here for early diagnosis and, and prevention. And many of you are probably already aware of this, but we can of course identify people who are at risk. We have, we have genomic, we have proteomic, we have metabolic, we have clinical risk scores that we can develop that identify people who are at increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So there's an opportunity certainly for primary prevention, but there's also a large window um, uh, of opportunity here for secondary prevention. And as you know, Alzheimer's disease actually begins in the brain some 10 to 20 years before the onset of symptoms. So knowing your risk, knowing what your risk factors are, allows one to well in advance at, attend to those modifiable risk factors to delay cognitive aging, to optimize cognitive performance, and to prevent or at least diminish or attenuate the onset and severity of dementia syndromes, including Alzheimer's disease. The same thing is true for Parkinson's disease. So we know that there are seminal symptoms and signs that can predict the onset of Parkinson's disease some eight to 15 years before the onset of symptoms. That's sort of prodromal period before tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and the other cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease actually begin. So for example, hyposmia or anosmia or loss of olfaction, sense of smell, REM sleep behavior disorder, constipation, some mood or affective disorders. When you put all of these things together with serum blood and imaging biomarkers, one can predict who, with some degree of accuracy actually, who is at risk for some of these diseases and allow one to intervene in a way that prevents the onset of the disease or at least delays the onset of the disease or attenuates the severity and provides an opportunity such that when new therapies do emerge, like we heard today with MCT, um, that may be an opportunity to intervene. If you knew that your risk was elevated, then you might use those supplements, use those therapies well in advance if you're at a high risk. I mentioned stroke, 80% of strokes can be prevented. I actually think that number is much higher now because we have um, the sophistication in our ability to manage risk factors like diabetes, obesity, uh, like we just talked about, hypertension is like never before. So our, our, our ability to prevent stroke, I believe, is, has been like never before. And so it's rather unfortunate that we have the same number of ischemic strokes here in this country and around the world. There's this Better Heart, Better Brain campaign from uh, the American Heart Association. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factors are seminal uh, in the, in the, as a risk factor for, for dementia. Many of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are the same risk factors for dementia, which is why this sort of tagline of better heart, better brain. In fact, as you probably know, after $60 billion spent on Alzheimer's disease research and trying to find new therapies, while we've had a couple of therapies approved, it's unlikely that they're going to make a substantial impact because we're getting to the disease too late and because the target amyloid may not be sufficiently robust. So there is a theory um, and a prevailing concept that with cognitive aging, with vascular aging um, and a reduction in cerebral blood flow that occurs over time with age, that may lead to a neuronal en energy crisis in the brain. And that may be um, a very potent risk factor for neurodegeneration. And so on the right-hand side of the slide here, I have a number of cardiovascular risk factors listed. And the arrows point to those where um, a very robust association has been made either for, from observational studies or from human genetic studies that show an increased risk for these risk factors for Alzheimer's disease or for non-Alzheimer's 
dementia and, uh, and vascular dementia. So there's a real opportunity here, as you can see, if we modify these cardiovascular risk factors and improve vascular health, we will improve brain health. Now there's, there's possibly some mechanistic explanations for why this is the case. And this is perhaps one of the prevailing concepts. And that is that with hypoxia, with a reduction in cerebral blood flow and a reduction in oxygen perfusion, there's an increased expression of what we call beta secretase and gamma secretase. And what those enzymes do is they process amyloid precursor protein to increase the production of, of amyloid beta. And we know that when blood flow is reduced, there's a synergistic reaction between that reduction in blood flow with amyloid beta to increase the aggregation and the deposition of tau, which is a pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So by maintaining adequate cerebral perfusion, by modifying those vascular risk factors over time, um, we can have an impact on both cognitive aging as well as uh, dementia. So what are the implications for us as individuals, for us as a general public, and for we as clinicians who have to begin to look after and optimize the cognitive health of our patients? Well, this is a, a, an illustration that I put together to sort of I illustrate the number of emerging opportunities that patients are becoming increasingly aware of and observational prospective cohort studies are identifying as potentially having uh, a benefit on cognitive aging and on reducing the incidence of dementia, including therapies like hyperbaric oxygen, sauna, cold immersion therapy, so our patients are increasingly asking about those. Then of course, there are modifiable risk fact, cardiometabolic risk factors that I've addressed. The importance of mental health as a risk factor, the importance of social isolation as a risk factor, and then physical cognitive exercise, resistance training, weight reduction, enhancing sleep, some gerotherapeutics, which may affect brain health, and some supplements as we just heard about. So you can see that there's a variety of different ways we can tackle this problem to optimize in a healthy population, cognitive health, delay cognitive aging, and reduce the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But as you can see, this takes a very coordinated a very, and a very concerted effort on the part of not just one physician, um, but a team. So this is a really a team sport to be able to optimally tackle brain health. So let's just talk a little bit about a couple of these. I, each one of these is a lecture unto itself. And so I don't have the time to go into all of these, but maybe address just a couple that I think might be of interest to this audience. And one is addressing cardiometabolic disease and weight. So you're probably familiar with this paper. And if you're not, I would encourage you to read it, but this is a paper from Nir Barzilai and his colleagues who looked and who did a geroscience guided repurposing of FDA approved drugs to target aging and ranked them on a score out of 12 in terms of those drugs that hit each of the hallmarks of aging, those drugs that have been shown in preclinical animal models to increase both health span and lifespan, and those drugs for which there's some evidence in humans that it affects human health span or reduces human mortality. And so you can see here that a number of anti-diabetic drugs, for example, like SGLT2 inhibitors and metformin have risen to the top as well as acarbose and rapamycin, and you can see the rest. So let me just address just a couple of these and how they address not just health span and lifespan, but also brain span. So this is data from two double-blind randomized controlled trials from national databases and prescri pres prescription registries that looked at the effect of GLP-1 receptor agonists. And I highlight this because this has become sort of the darling drugs in Hollywood right now, and everybody's trying to get their hands on drugs like Ozempic, as you'll recognize it, or Monjoro, these GLP-1 receptor agonists for weight loss. But, and so they're remarkably effective for weight loss. They're remarkably effective for the management of type two diabetes, but they may also be effective for the treatment of brain health or for the prevention or reduce the risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. So this was a study, this pooled analysis showed that over time in a large population of P type two diabetics who were exposed to these GLP-1 receptor antagonists, you can see on the left, the reduced incidence of dementia over time. 
And compared to other anti-diabetic medications here, you can see that GLP-1 receptor antagonists significantly reduce the incidence of dementia compared to some of these other anti-diabetic medications. So the reason why I think this is important is because some of these molecules are not only geroprotective and may not only reduce the risk of or the modifiable risk of some of those cardiovascular risk factors. You can see here on the S on, on the on left hand side here, hypertension. When you treat someone with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, you not only cause them to lose weight and increase their, enhance their glucose disposal, but you also reduce glycation end products. You optimize the manage, uh, treatment of their hypertension and some of the metabolic inflammatory risk factors like elevated C-reactive protein and interleukins also decrease as well. So it, it has an effect on systemic health and risk factors that um, are significant risk factors for, for dementia, but they also may have a direct neuroprotective effect on the brain. So GLP-1 agonists, for example, reduce oxidative stress. They reduce neuronal death by decreasing apoptosis in the brain. They actually reduce the production of and deposition of beta amyloid and tau in preclinical models. They reduce inflammation, they enhance insulin signaling, and they actually increase neuronal and synaptic plasticity. So in addition to having an indirect effect on brain health by reducing these cardiovascular risk factors, they also may have a direct neuroprotective effect. And as you can see here at the bottom, I've highlighted one study ongoing now with semaglutide in people with early Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, a research study that's happening right now, and I think we're going to be seeing more of these. My plea would be that we not just treat people with early or mid-stage Alzheimer's disease, and I think what we're going to see happen over time is that this, the, the curve is gonna to shift to the left here where we're going to be identifying people at risk for Alzheimer's disease and modifying their systemic and brain health before, they, before the onset of symptoms. Because if you have a disease that's incubating for 10 or 20 years, much of the damage will have already been done by the time symptoms occur. SGLT2 inhibitors, the sodium glucose transporters, which are approved now for the treatment of type 2 diabetes and can be very effective, have a number of benefits as, as near Barzilai and his colleagues pointed out in terms of extending healthy longevity by a variety of different mechanisms, by increasing mitochondrial function, by increasing oxidative stress, by increasing systemic inflammation. And so there are many mechanisms, including mTOR inhibition and increased AMP kinase pathways by which they may reduce aging. But in addition to that, these same mechanisms are at play. So SGLT2 inhibitors and transgenic Alzheimer's disease mice models do all of these things in, hippocamp in the hippocampi. So in the, the area of the brain that's so important for laying down new memory. And so now there are a, a few studies showing, one is on the right-hand side, you can see a case control observational study in almost 200,000 patients with diabetes, of course, because these are approved for the treatment of diabetes. But the use of both GLP-1 agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors in this study was associated with a 58% reduction in the incidence of dementia. Now, this is an association, not necessarily causation, but very encouraging and certainly worthy of further study. In another study with almost a million patients treated over 15 years with an SGLT2 inhibitor, one saw a significantly reduced incidence of dementia over time in these patients. So you can see that these drugs, which have an indirect effect on brain health by affecting cardiovascular risk factors and type two diabetes, can also have a direct neuroprotective effect possibly on the brain itself. Finally, I'll, I'll just mention metformin because there are a lot of people right now taking metformin, not just for type two diabetes, uh, but also for lifespan extension or for healthy longevity. In fact, today, 160 million people will swallow a metformin tablet. Now metformin has a lot of indirect effects which could actually improve brain health, such as improving insulin sensitivity, improving vascular health, reducing systemic inflammation and reducing these glycation end products that result from prolonged hyperglycemia. But again, they may also, metformin may also have a direct neuroprotective effect on the brain by inhibiting apoptosis, by reducing beta amyloid production, by reducing oxidative stress, by reducing K2 
key inflammatory pathways in the brain, including NF-kappa B, and by promoting neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. So there's an extensive preclinical work that's been done to demonstrate the metformin's potential on enhancing brain health. So you can see uh, some of those mechanisms there on the right. And now there's abundant data to suggest that there definitely is an association, whether there's a cause, causal role that metformin may play in reducing the incidence of dementia will probably emerge from near Barzilai's TAME study. But metformin now in this systematic review and meta-analysis of three studies showed that cognitive impairment was significantly less, 55% less prevalent in people with diabetes taking metformin. And there are now six studies that have shown that dementia incidence was also significantly reduced. So while the, there's some mixed data out there, I think the burden of evidence would suggest that there's a potentially a role that metformin may play in enhancing brain health. And in this systematic review and meta-analysis that was recently published just last year, both with regard to cognitive impairment and dementia, metformin use was associated with a reduced risk of both of those. It wasn't actually seen to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, um, but obviously more work needs to be done there. But I do want to mention this because as illustrated earlier in the initial presentation, the use of MCT and indeed the use of any gerotherapeutic supplement drug may actually, and this is where precision and personalized medicine come in, one must know uh, the genetic profile of an individual, which is why we do whole genome sequencing on all of our patients. And here's an example of why. So this was a, a, a nice study with about 1,600 people who were followed prospectively in the Alzheimer's from the Alzheimer's Coordinating Center database here in the United States. And what they were able to show here is that metformin was associated with better immediate and delayed memory in cognitively normal people with type two diabetes, but only in APOE4 non-carriers. There was actually a greater decline in delayed memory, specifically using metformin in APOE4 carriers. And this is actually consistent with animal models, transgenic animal models, express who are APOE4 positive, so carry two alleles for the APOE4, where there's actually increased neurodegeneration in these transgenic mouse models. So as you can see, while metformin may play a role and may be associated with healthy cognitive aging and may reduce the incidence of dementia, it may be not in the entire population, but in those who are non-APOE4 carriers, which is which is, again, a signal as to why precision and personalized medicine is, is so important. There are two ongoing trials right now, the METFINGER and the MAP study, the Metformin and Alzheimer's Disease Prevention Study. And so we anxiously await the results of those studies. Uh, but keep your eye on, on, on this evolving story. In addition, I'll mention this just this with rapamycin because I've seen, I saw a patient yesterday who was taking rapamycin uh, for lifespan extension. And there is certainly preclinical evidence to suggest that rapamycin has a direct neuroprotective effect um, with some of the same pathways involved, as I mentioned, with metformin, of course, because rapamycin targets all of those biological hallmarks of aging, not just in the body, but also in the brain. Unfortunately, in established Alzheimer's disease, rapamycin may have the opposite effect because one of the things rapamycin does is increases uh, lysosomal production. And in Alzheimer's disease, there's a problem with axonal transport of these lysosomes back to this, where they pick up, where lysosomes pick up debris back to, and bring it back to the cell body where it's degraded. There's a problem with that transport in people with Alzheimer's disease. And so if there's increasing production uh, of those in people with rapamycin, that may lead to increased neuronal death over time. And there was a recent study published showing that microglial mTOR activation, so microglia are resident immune cells in the brain, and they're responsible for um, an inflammatory response in the brain, but also protecting the brain. And so microglial mTOR activation upregulates a receptor known as TREM2, which actually enhances the clearance of beta amyloid from the brain. So if you can imagine, if you're on an, M, an mTOR inhibitor, um, you decrease that 
expression of TREM2, and you may decrease the clearance of beta amyloid and allow for more beta amyloid to be deposited. So timing may be everything in addition to whether a person is um, ApoE4 positive. So there's a study right now ongoing looking at the effects of rapamycin on Alzheimer's and cognitive health known as the REACH study. But again, timing is everything and getting to people who are at risk before the onset of symptoms may be very, may be key to whether or not these drugs and gerotherapeutics actually enhance brain health and reduce dementia over time. So coming back uh, to this, I'll mention just one more thing, um, which I think is often neglected and unfortunately not promoted um, in neurological clinics, but, but it is in, it, and it is and it should be in brain health clinics. And that is, we all know about e physical exercise, but I thought what I'd do is mention just cognitive exercise here for a moment. So there are a number of seminal studies that have, been sh that have shown that plasticity-based adaptive cognitive training one st seminal study dating back to 2004 and a plethora of studies since that time have shown that the majority of people who practice this on an ongoing basis will actually show improvements in multiple different cognitive domains, including information processing speed, working memory, delayed memory. And that, as you can see at the bottom here, some of the effects of this are durable over time. So practicing the you know adaptive cognitive training over let's say three months can give you years of protection. So one of the things that we recommend, of course, for everyone who's interested about brain health is to, is to exercise that organ uh, by doing exercises like this, cognitive training that has been shown to actually in healthy older adults, not in patients who are necessarily at risk for cognitive uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease shown to actually enhance cognitive performance. And the poster child for the effect of this is someone you may all recognize and be familiar with, uh, Tom Brady, who is probably the best uh, football player, American football player to have ever lived. And he, amongst other things, attributes his sense of spatial awareness, his ability to read a defense and process information and his reaction um, to cognitive training. So um, we, we encourage our patients uh, who are interested in maintaining their brain health to actually take this seriously and, and practice this adaptive cognitive training. I certainly do so myself. So applying the science to the person, as I said, I think brain health clinics are starting to pop up. I think it's going to be the future. Um, and I think what is a brain health program? Well, it's a very proactive and personalized approach that uses some of the most advanced technologies, which we have here today available to measure and monitor brain health, to predict the risk of future dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and enable a team of experts who are working together to optimize the health of the brain, to optimize cognitive performance, to minimize cognitive aging, and decrease the risk um, of cognitive aging and dementia over time. So, we deploy a number uh, of diagnostics in our brain health program, including blood biomarkers. So the day is coming very soon, I think, when we will do, we will have, as one of my colleagues, uh, Richard Isaacson talks about a cholesterol test for the brain. So we, when we go in for our general health examination, one thing that is done is we get a CBC and we get serum chemistries and we get a blood lipid panel, we get our cholesterol checked. Well, uh, there's a day coming when we'll have the same thing in the blood for Alzheimer's disease, it's already here. Um, it's, just, it's just not distributed and disseminated and not practiced, um, but blood biomarkers are going to be uh, a big part of our future in identifying people who are at risk or when disease has already begun. I'm taking a very multiomic approach. So I mentioned we do whole genome sequencing, but we also do proteomics and metabolomics because there are now risk profiles, certain metabolic, certain proteomic and certain metabolomic risk profiles that appear to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. We do something here called brain vital signs. So just as you go into your doctor and get your blood pressure taken, we actually have a technology now, not we, we didn't develop this, but we deploy it, a technology that actually looks at event-related potentials that actually allows one to understand the speed and efficiency with which people process information. 
And so anything that we deploy in clinical practice, whether it's modifying risk factors, whether it's introducing MCT oil, we can measure and monitor and track the effect of that uh, on the brain over time. Obviously, we take a very comprehensive cardiac uh, approach to cardiac and, and metabolic risk factor reduction. Uh, we do extensive neural, neural and neurovascular imaging, including we do arterial spin labeling, which where we look at cerebral perfusion. So we have over 600 miles of, of blood vessels in our brain, most of which we can't actually image because they're small blood vessels, the width of a hair in our head that penetrate the brain substance. So we can actually not see those vessels, um, but we can see indirectly whether they're diseased by looking just not only at the brain parenchyma and see whether or not there's any microvascular signature that's been left behind, but also the extent to which the brain is being perfused. And uh, we do a very quantitative neurological assessment. So it's not just hitting a few reflexes um, and, and watching people's eye movements and doing a baseline neurological examination, which is important, but quite subjective, but we take a very quantitative approach to this by looking at, in a very quantitative way, eye movements, hearing, um, speech analytics, because some of the subtle changes of neurodegenerative disease that may not be obvious to the patient or to family or loved ones um, can be detected using AI evaluation of speech in a way that um, even we as, uh, as clinicians and, and experts couldn't detect. We also measure olfaction. We take a very quantitative approach to gait, motion uh, analysis and sleep because we're looking for subtle signs that belie the presence of a neurodegenerative disease, which is incubating that may actually affect that patient 10 to 20 years down the road and trying to diminish their risk of having that disease over time. So in conclusion, um, there's much that we can do to improve cognitive health and to diminish the risk or at least delay the onset or attenuate the severity of dementia and many of the devastating diseases um, that, that affect humanity. But it's a team sport, and it requires really kind of an extensive evaluation to allow us to understand one's risk, identify markers that increase the risk, personalize therapy, um, knowing what we can and can't use at different stages of a person's brain health trajectory, very much as a team sport. And we here work very much as, as a team with cardiology and internal medicine and women's health um, to try to personalize um, the care of these people to optimize their brain health over time. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to trying to answer any questions that you might have. And Dr. Meyer, thank you so much for the invitation once again. Thank you so much, um, Professor Dorek. This was a mind-blowing presentation. And um, I really loved the last slides where you actually said to optimize the brain health and not just to prevent the decline or maintenance of, of cognition. And I think this is what we have in common, the fields of brain health, what you do, and the healthy longevity field where we really try to optimize the body, optimizing the health of individuals. So may I ask you the first question, why is it not yet implemented, even in annual health screens, to look at this vital vital organ, our brain, to actually measure how our cognitive capacity is at this moment in time, whereas we are checking the glucose level and we are checking a blood pressure, et cetera? Um, that's a great question, Andrea. I will say the, my response to that is ABC. Um, first of all, awareness. Awareness that we now have the ability to measure, monitor, and track brain health over time. I don't think, you know, when the World Health Organization for the first time in its history establishes a brain health unit in 2019, just four years ago, and just last year, just one year ago, adopted an intersectoral global action plan to take this more seriously because of the opportunity that we now have. You can imagine that with the 15 to 20 year gap from discovery, to actually bedside practice that is typical in medicine today, it's going to take time to create awareness of, of, of our ability to do this. I'll also say bandwidth. I mean, there is 
0.05 neurologists per 100,000 people, for example, in low and middle income countries. And so even the expertise that's available to actually begin, launch, and drive these brain health programs is simply not there. And the second, the third thing is capacity. And by capacity, I mean a lot of these things, Andrea, at least in countries like the United States, is not reimbursed. So these technologies are not deployed because they're simply not reimbursed. So for me to do what I'm doing here in sort of a typical academic setting is a non-starter, right? Because this takes time, it takes resources, it takes money. And if this is not reimbursed and we can't be compensated for our time, unfortunately, I hate to talk business here, but let's face it, um, if, there's, if there's no capacity to resource this kind of infrastructure that's needed at scale at the present time, it's gonna take a while for governments um, to exact policy and to make available some of these technologies. Not all of them are, are necessarily necessary. And we'll learn over time, what is the core set of diagnostics that need to be done and need to be tracked over time. But until national policies become available where, re where, where clinicians are resourced to do this, it's gonna take some time, I think. As I mentioned, at not one single country in Sub-Saharan Africa even has a national policy to address Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Um, so we've got a lot of we've got a lot of work to do. But it's it's sad for me that we can change the trajectory of people's brain health over time today, and that's only going to get better in the future. You know, there's a saying that the future is here; it's just not evenly distributed. And nowhere could that is that more true than than right here. Yes. And you also depicted quite nicely that the cognitive decline is the outcome of lots of changes occurring much, much earlier, which are associated with lots of other diseases we would like to prevent. For example, cardiovascular disease, um, think about heart failure, diabetes, etc. So that would mean, I would say, that you have lots of arguments because you are at the end of the chain of very often um, to tackle not only the brain, but also the cardiovascular system and the endocrine system, et cetera. Do you work together with these kind of societies to then really leverage on the huge potential of individuals at middle age in the end to really guide uh, your collaborative efforts to bring health to, to individuals and maybe not just brain health. Yeah, it's an excellent question. I'm, I've always been a, a staunch proponent of collaboration and working together because the problems are too huge to be able to tackle alone. Um, I don't know that enough I, you know, I'm skeptical that a sufficient amount of collaboration happens between these societies to be able to take a coordinated approach. For example, I chair the American Brain Foundation, right? And, you know, I've been involved with some of the leading neurological associations in the world. However, I have yet to see a robust collaboration between brain health organizations, if you will, and the American Heart Association, um, or the World Stroke Society, or the Diabetes Foundation, right? So there's not enough collaboration, in my opinion, because you're right, we are the end of the road, we're the final common pathway. And if we can improve weight um, and systemic health and reduce the incidence of diabetes, as I said, we don't even get the simple things right. We're doing a terrible job in managing diabetes, hypertension, globally, I mean, um, obesity. So if we just manage the simple things right and work together to get those modifiable risk factors right, we will improve systemic health. We will reduce the, the risk of chronic disease. The two thirds of the population right now have at least one chronic disease, right? And so, you know, you, everyone here is interested in healthy longevity. So if we could delay aging and we could delay the development of chronic disease, we would inevitably have a massive impact on brain health. So working together is, which is why, you know, I reached out to you uh, some time ago to work together 
Um, if we can set, establish these international consortia where we're working together with one voice, because we often, there, there's, well, there, while a half a trillion dollars is given every year in philanthropy in this country alone, we're still not resourced. If three, if if the three top one of three of the top neurological disorders cost three trillion dollars a year globally, we need to pool our resources, right? And we need to pool our efforts uh, rather than working in silos and trying to tackle what is a, a very massive problem. So there isn't enough collaboration, in my opinion, um, but there can be, and it's forms like this that will hopefully be the stimulus and the spark that will launch those collaborative efforts. Yeah. My last question before going to Grace, and I think she has lots of questions, is in the end, it's about change in behavior, I think, of human beings. And that would already bring lots of benefits to not only brain health, but to the health of our body. Is knowing what kind of risk factors you have, is that enough to change the behavior of many individuals? For example, knowing that somebody is APOE for positive. Yeah, well, I think knowing, just to, to follow your example there, knowing if you're APOE for positive is probably a very powerful motivator. I know it's a very powerful motivator. If, if I was APOE for positive, then the exercise I know I need, physical exercise, for example, and the dietary regimens I need to adopt will become extremely important for me. So knowing, not, not fear-mongering, but knowing what your risk profile is and knowing it early enough allows you to take advantage of all of the treatments including those like exercise, getting enough sleep. I mean, this sounds like motherhood and apple pie, but knowing that you're at risk really can and does, in my experience, change behavior. Now, not in everybody. Um, and so talking to a 35-year-old who might be a type 2 diabetic and might be overweight, they're not really thinking about their necessarily their long-term risk of dementia. So making sure that they're at least aware of that. And instead of taking the approach of the fact, instead of taking the approach that we're going to reduce your risk of dementia over time, because as a 35 year old, you know, you, you know, as a 35 year old, we weren't thinking about that. We're thinking about it now, but we weren't thinking about it then. Um, at least I wasn't. Um, most 35 or most 30 year olds aren't thinking about that. But what they are interested in is enhancing their cognitive performance. So if, if I tell you that I can improve your reaction time, your processing speed, um, your spatial awareness, your working memory, you're going to be in because whether you're in finance, whether you're in medicine, doesn't matter what, whether, or whether you're practice, you know, you have to memorize a script for as an actor, you're going to be interested in increasing those cognitive functions. So if we took a different approach, by telling them that there are things that we can do that optimize your cognitive health and cognitive performance. I think that might be a better approach to get people to change their behavior and show them the evidence that like I did with the cognitive training, with the physical exercise, it's one thing for me to sit here and tell you this, but I think <clears throat> I often have slideshows that I show my patients. So I actually turn the computer around and give them a mini presentation because a picture is sometimes worth a thousand words. So you have to show them the data. And I think if you do that and you spend time with them and educate them, it can be very compelling, particularly if they have an increased risk. And you know, I'm someone who has an increased risk. Um, there's a risk of Alzheimer's disease in my family. So I'm motivated to do the things that I need to do so that I can be able to come back here next year, maybe give another presentation or, or to continue to do, to do the job that I do. We will absolutely invite you. Grace, over to you. Okay, uh, so thank you, Andrea, for the introduction um, and Dr. David Dodik for the interesting presentation. So today we have a few questions from the audience uh, and let's start with this question. Uh, so Dr. David, you mentioned that when it comes to brain health, we are shifting from palliative care to preventive care. So since you mentioned that heart health and brain health is associated, 
one audience member would like to know your opinion on the role of deep meditation and yoga on brain health since they seem to prevent coronary heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So stress in all of its forms has emerged as a significant risk factor, not only for emotional and mental health, but also for cognitive and brain health. So in our program, for example, we take this very seriously. We don't have every person see a psychiatrist, but we have people coached in resilience and in wellness behaviors like Pilates, yoga, mindfulness-based stress reduction therapies. I think that's critically important for both emotional health as well as cognitive health, as well as, as the uh, person asking the question for overall systemic health and cardiovascular health. There are a thousand different physiological reactions in the body to stress. And we know some of the molecular pathways, including some of the neuroinflammatory pathways that are triggered in the brain in response to stress. A whole host of different chemical mediators are released in the brain in response to stress. And we know from functional imaging studies and people doing meditation, deep meditation and mindfulness, we see certain areas in the brain and we see the functional connectivity in the brain change in a very positive way. So I don't think there's any doubt that people who practice these therapies are going to be better off emotionally, cognitively, and physically over time. And it's a, it's a big part of our program. Okay, thank you for the answer. Okay, uh, so you also mentioned drugs such as metformin could improve brain health. And since metformin kind of addresses impaired glucose metabolism, then would a low carbohydrate diet help in improving brain health as well? So there have been studies, you know, there's a consortium known as um, that are involved in setting guidelines for nutrition for dementia prevention. <clears throat> and there are some studies that have demonstrated that the MIND diet, for example, which is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the diet to stop hypertension, um, is beneficial for cognitive health over time. And so, you know, again, when we're providing patients with nutritional counseling, we're recommending diets like the MIND diet. And the one thing about the MIND diet is it is low in carbohydrates, right? So mm -hmm. it, it up, you know, it, their legumes and, and berries and vegetable, green leafy vegetables and an adequate amount of protein um, is a diet that because carbohydrates and glucose disposal and the development of glycation end products and insulin insensitivity is so important, we believe, for Alzheimer's disease and for other dementias and for impaired vascular health, which as I mentioned, contributes to dementia. I think, yes, um, having a, a lower carbohydrate diet and minimizing the amount of sugar, especially processed sugar in one's diet, is critical and essential for brain health. Um, so yeah, it, for, for those in the audience, if I were to tell you um, how to modify your diet, I would look up the MIND diet um, or a Mediterranean diet, and I would try to stick to that as closely as possible. We also have a question uh, from the audience. They are kind of interested in um, uh, how they can counter the lack of sleep risk in brain health when work demands long hours. So is there any evidence-based value-added suggestion when one is already healthy in all other aspects of lifestyle, but cannot change behavior in terms of sleep? <laughs> you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite here, but I used to wear as a badge of honor the fact that I could get by on four hours sleep per night. No, seriously. Um, and... I, I need to be, to be productive. I felt like I don't need that amount of sleep. I can get by in four hours and I don't feel tired. However, I've completely changed my view on that. Um, so some of the people that I'm collaborating with now are leading thinkers in the area of sleep. And the data now is just overwhelming that an adequate amount of sleep is essential, not only for cardiometabolic health, but also for brain health. And so for those people, and I was one of them <clears throat> who was a workaholic and trying to get by on as little sleep as possible, it's not worth it because it will diminish over, over time your ability to be as productive. 
uh, <clears throat> people might say, well, you know, look at me, I'm you know, years old now, and I'm still uh, trying to be productive. And if I got by with four hours of sleep uh, for that long, maybe it's not such a bad thing. But I will tell you that, especially not knowing your risk profile, let's say you were one of the 25% of the people in the population who was an APOE4 carrier, right? And let's say you have some insulin resistance. You don't have diabetes, you don't have prediabetes, but you have some insulin resistance. If you don't know your molecular profile and if you don't know your risk factors and you're not getting a requisite amount of sleep, that, is, that just adds fuel to the fire. So my recommendation, there are plenty of recommendations we give people to enhance their sleep. So insomnia is a treatable condition. I know 20% of the population have insomnia, but it is a very treatable condition through both non-pharmacological as well as pharmacological means. So, <clears throat> so we take a very active approach to that, but we are insistent that people get the requisite amount of sleep. So <clears throat> you'll be more productive in the long run, I guarantee you, um, if you get an adequate amount of sleep. So we don't, we take no prisoners when it comes to um, ensuring that people are aware of the data between sleep and cognitive aging. Um, and especially, you know, when we identify people who do have risk factors for Alzheimer's disease uh, or dementia, we, we talk seriously and we take very seriously in um, sleep. And we actually use a variety of wearables and nearables to track. So we have a bedside nearable as well as wearables that people have, whether it's their Fitbit or whether it's their Aura to track their sleep. And we're now in the process of setting up a dashboard where we're monitoring all of this incoming sensor data including sleep, presenting that back to them in a way that's understandable, tracking that over time while we initiate and implement measures, both non-drug and drug, to try to enhance their sleep. So uh, moving on to the next question, what do you think about the future possibility of shifting from the DSM approach of diagnosis of mental health conditions from just behavioral observations to incorporating more actual biomarkers, which you mentioned earlier? Yeah, I think... The approach to mental health, just as the, just similar to the approach to metabolic health and brain health, will be precision guided and personalized based on imaging, as well as serum, as well as clinical biomarkers. So I think, unfortunately, we, I don't think that, I say we, I don't think that as a general, as a medical community, we personalize the treatment to the extent that we can, even when it comes to mental health right now. So I have no doubt that mental health, just like metabolic, cardiometabolic, cardiovascular, brain health over time will become precision guided and personalized based on risk profiles, um, as well as based on molecular profiling. So maybe we can uh, move on to the last question. Uh, one audience member would like to know whether uh, you think anything can be done to improve the accessibility of people from lower middle income countries to cardiac care, considering its importance to brain or cognitive health. Yeah, well, I think this, this intersectoral global action plan that was adopted back in uh, May of last year calls for in 10 years that 80% of countries will adopt a national health plan towards optimizing brain health and reducing risk factors that are associated with dementia. So when you have an international consortium publishing a Lancet commission three years ago, identifying that 40% of dementias may be preventable today, that's only gonna get better over time. And when you see the, the poor job that we're doing and just doing the simple things right, as I said, and in managing risk factors, I think, again, we're gonna be talking about brain health both at the national level as well as at the clinical level over the next 50 years in the same way we talked about heart health. And just like most of those countries that I said don't have a brain health plan, they all have a heart health plan, mm. right? But they don't have a brain health plan. So I'm very optimistic, very optimistic that that's going to change. I don't know that we'll hit 80% over the next 10 years, but I think back to Andrea's point, if we work together, that's why we published that paper just two months ago on the global synergistic actions that are going to be necessary to make sure that this is implemented, that brain health is accessible for people around the world, especially in low and middle income countries where I said 80% of the burden of neurological diseases rests in those countries, 80%. 
So, you know, it breaks my heart that yes, while my patient might not get be able to get access to one of these new GLP-1 receptor agonists, people in low and middle income countries can't even get access to a healthcare practitioner to be able to address some of the easily modifiable risk factors that are you know, staring them in the face. So I'm optimistic that things will get better over time. <clears throat> and I think it's, um, I think it's these global awareness campaigns and these global initiatives that are starting. And as Andrea said, hopefully more international collaboration. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Thank you, Grace, um, for moderating it so well. Um, I would say let's protect our 600 miles. I didn't know that, but 600 miles of vessels in our brains. And may I change the slogan a little bit? You said better heart, better brain. May I say optimizing our heart, optimizing our brain, optimizing our body? I'm with you 100%. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much for, for this wonderful, uh, wonderful lecture. The audience, please, um, you listening to this wonderful talk, um, leave your suggestions in the chat function. Uh, we are really listening to you. If you have a speaker you would really like to, to hear from, let us know. In the chat box, you will also find our recently published papers. On the 6th of July, um, Professor Brian Kennedy will host Professor Sue Josin. And um, she is professor of reproductive uh, sciences and obstetrics and gynecology at Columbia University. I will leave you today uh, with our final video. And the video is showing the importance of an intergenerational approach. Take care. My name is Arthur. I'm four. To him, having two dads is very, very normal. His friends think it's great. I've got two dads. Wow, that must be amazing. Arthur really wants us to meet Rita. I was wondering whether I refer to them as Daddy One and Daddy Two. Yep. Or whether I say Daddy Paul or Daddy Wade. I don't think they'll take offence either which way. And I mean, it's no big deal. Oh, absolutely not, yeah. They're just beautiful people because they have a beautiful child. Yeah. Rita. <laughs> Hello, I know that I can't hug you, but I really want to hug you, but oh, I can't God, because... God. How are you? Wonderful. So are you d number one or number two? I am number one. Daddy Paul. Daddy Paul. Do you know, Paul, that little boy stood at those curtains there and he looked around the room he made a beeline for me and that little man landed in my arms and there he stayed. <laughs> just surprised me just how well we got on. Today, so I just felt quite actually emotional to be quite honest because, because I feel like you're part of our life already. It was really emotional because it just felt like I was meeting someone who was like family. Can we do a self? <laughs> that was what we always wanted to have as a result out of this whole experience for Arthur. The friendship with Arthur means to me a great deal because my grandchildren, the youngest is 21. So I'm really needing the love that a young one gives. Bye, Paul. And that's where Arthur comes in. Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down.